Agri Talk for another week. I think this is our second show. Second show, yes. Second show. So, uh, how's agriculture right now? It's March. Things are starting to it, warm it, up. It's starting to warm up. I think a lot of people's getting real active that it's finally got rid of all the snow, which yeah. appeared in 15 inches in our area and mm -hmm. gone in like three days. But then now it's starting to warm up. It's a great time. Yeah. So. And with a recent like 70 degree day, I'm sure everybody oh. started getting the itch to go mm -hmm. to you know absolutely see what they could plant in the ground mm -hmm. everything's mm -hmm. yeah if we didn't have all that out. all that water to get rid of right now but it's yeah. starting to go down finally mm -hmm. so now i think the the farmers are, are ready to get get out in the field or getting getting that itch to get out there and plant something so they can say they got it in the ground early mm -hmm. so. uh speaking about water water our, yes our guest this week is dr laura too and you are into aquaculture. I am. Is that like the culture of fish, the religions, and <laughs> all that sort of thing? Well, you're, you're almost right on. It's the culture of uh, fish, animals, and plants in water. So instead of agriculture, it's aquaculture. Okay. But we do more than just fish. We do shrimp and some uh, decorative plants for water gardens. Basically everything that's in a pond or does it cover oceans too? Uh, there is some aquaculture out in the oceans. In Ohio, we only deal with the freshwater systems, uh, mm -hmm. which include ponds, cages, tanks inside, raceways, a lot of different mm -hmm. systems you can grow fish in. Not rivers, necessarily. Uh, rivers aren't the best place. You to might cover study <laughs> that. But. Maybe yeah. the little home fish ponds and such. A lot to of backyard, backyard water yeah, backyard gardens, ponds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the hottest thing right now uh, that I get a lot of requests for information on is aquaponics, oh, uh, yeah. where you're well, raising fish and then using... Uh, the waste products from the fish to fertilize plants. That's mm -hmm. a pretty hot topic right yeah. now. Do you have to add anything to that besides maybe fish food or? Fish food is your main input mm -hmm. and uh, then the fish provide the uh, ammonia uh, for the plants. Uh, depends on what kind of water you're using. If you're using well water or city water, you might have to add a little iron or some other supplements if your water source is lacking in those. But uh, For the plants or for the for fish? For the plants. Okay. Yeah, for the, for the fish, the only input is the food. And then you want to dechlorinate it probably. You have to dechlorinate it if you're using the city water, yes. So you have to keep your fish happy and your plants happy. Awesome. So what do people do with small ponds? I mean, like the garden ponds that you see. Well, garden ponds have been just, uh, people have them for hobbies, decorative, just uh, um, enjoying relaxing in the backyard on the mm -hmm. deck, growing a lot of uh, koi, goldfish, and other ornamental mm -hmm. yeah. uh, fish. It, it was pretty hot in the... Uh, uh, 90s and the early 2000s, it's waned a little bit. Yeah, I've got uh, one a little recently. bit bigger than this desk in my backyard, but yeah. sometimes it's been a struggle keeping the fish alive. Yeah, I don't know. You think it's more or less a closed thing, and you can just add some food, but there's a little bit more maintenance, I guess. Where there's you a little bit more maintenance. It. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that really grows well in mine is the frogs. Frogs. They don't care. The, it they, seems like they are. That was, and they the, sing pretty at night. Yeah. So. Yeah. I love watching the frogs. <laughs> They're I a lot take of fun. pictures. And I can get as close as here to my frogs. I've got a yeah. backyard water garden, and I've switched from koi to just raising tilapia for mm -hmm. food in it. Uh, but we also have some honeybees, and my bees love my water garden. They, they use hmm. it to uh, get water a lot, too. And, of course, the birds like to take baths there, too. So. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. a little wildlife uh, attractant. <laughs> Can't beat that. Well, hey, Laura, you work at the, the Ohio State University South Centers and and recently you've just started a program that's actually been a couple of years now right. that's called the ABC program? It is. Tell it's, us about that. It, it's called Aquaculture Boot Camp and it's not as scary as it sounds. Ah. But, uh, uh, aquaculture, um, a lot of people are interested in it, but it has what we say a very long learning curve. It's not something, like you said, you had some challenges with your water garden. It's not something you just get in overnight and you just, it's easy to do. Uh, it has about a five year learning curve if you're doing it on your own to really? learn everything you need to know from how to raise the fish, keep your fish healthy, what they're going to eat, and how to market your fish and sell your fish. Hmm. So it's a, there's a lot to learn. So what we did is we developed a program called Aquaculture Boot Camp, or mm -hmm. ABC, where we bring in new and beginning fish farmers and we try to shorten that learning curve down to one year. So we offer mm -hmm. them a year of very intensive training and we do that at the OSU South Centers in Piketon. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say new and beginning, so so I, I'm just thinking about going into it. I, I don't really have fish right now. I may not even have a pond, but it could be something that I'm looking at 
Now, is that could be could that be something that's uh, would be a money maker for me, it, or is that or are we looking at that big a scale at the moment? Well, aquaculture, like any kind of agriculture, the, the amount of money you're going to make does de is determined by your scale. If you're going yeah. to be small scale, it's very difficult to make money, and that's one of the things we teach you in boot camp. Mm -hmm. exactly. Now, as somebody who's just interested in getting started in aquaculture, you may not be ready for boot camp yet because it is very intensive. Mm -hmm. You may want to just access some of the resources that we have online. We have mm -hmm. a lot of fact sheets online. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of videos online, and we have a lot of information that you can get directly off our website. Start there and do your background research, and then if you're interested in go taking it a step further, that's when you would sign up for the intensive boot camp training. Oh. Uh -huh. How big of a pond or, you know, at what scale do people get serious? It would it just be like a half acre pond or? It's a good question and it's one that's really hard to answer right. because it depends on what species you're going to raise and um, what you consider to be successful. Some people think if I make $2,000 a year, that's a success. Some people don't consider it a success unless they make a living wage, which in farming is typically mm -hmm. around $50,000 a mm -hmm. year. And so it really, it, you first have to determine what you would consider a success. If you're just wanting to feed your family, then a quarter acre or a half acre pond would do it. If you're wanting to actually uh, go to a farmer's market, you would probably need a couple of ponds or some indoor tank systems. If you're wanting to make a living wage, you would either need a large indoor recirculating system or probably about five one acre ponds. Hmm, okay, that's good information. Yeah. So if I want to go to this ABC boot camp, can I just pop in there, or how, how, do, how, do, I, how do I get into the boot camp? Well, yeah, am I selected? Am I drafted? How, is, how does that work? You're drafted. Yeah, all of a sudden I get a letter, oh, you're going to raise some fish today. Yeah. Actually, it was part of a USDA grant program that we got. The USDA is very interested in food security and, mm -hmm. and uh, getting more younger farmers, getting younger people into farming. Uh, the average age of most farmers in the United States is about 65 or You're higher. Right, yeah. So there's a lot of concern that young people aren't being attracted into farming. Mm -hmm. So this was part of a grant program to att attract uh, new and beginning farmers. So they classify a new and beginning farmer as anyone who has been in that business less than 10 years. Uh -huh. So they also recognize the long learning curves that come with learning any type of agriculture, be it strawberries, fish, mm -hmm. pawpaw trees, uh, honeybees, whatever yeah. you want. Uh, there's this learning curve. So we actually recruited, uh, we put out a, a call for people to come to our boot camp and we had about 60 applicants for 25 places. So it was a selective process. People okay. had to apply, they had to write a short essay, they had to let us know, and we tended to prefer people who had one to two years experience already, so mm -hmm. we knew that they were serious about it because we were going to be investing a lot of time uh, mm -hmm. in the hands-on portion of the, the program and the business planning portion of the program. Wow. So you do have to be selected. Mm -hmm. But for the two years that the grant operated, it was free. Mm -hmm. We're now considering continuing the program, but it will be a fee-based program. And we, we don't know what that's going to be yet. Okay. That's great. So, so it, as you uh, selected these people, and you said there's 25, mm -hmm. so d and it's a year long? It is a year-long program. We, we selected 25 new uh -huh. beginning fish farmers, and they came from all over Ohio. Uh, we actually even had one from Indiana, mm -hmm. and they were required to come to our uh, aquaculture facility in Python, Ohio, the second Saturday, second Saturday of every month for a year. So they had to commit to coming for 12 Saturdays. And on those Saturdays, we did whatever hands-on activity we were doing at our research center anyway. Mm -hmm. So if we were spawning yellow perch, we would spawn yellow perch. If we were stocking freshwater shrimp in the ponds, we would stock freshwater shrimp in the ponds. So they got a lot of hands-on activity, mm -hmm. collecting water quality, feeding fish, stocking fish, harvesting fish, processing fish, whatever we were doing for a year. In addition to those 12 monthly sessions, they were also required to attend three conferences or workshops so that they could network with other fish farmers and get some advanced training on some important topics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then their final requirement was to attend a bus tour of farms uh, that we do once a year and we mm -hmm. get a big bus loaded up with 50 people and tour about four or five fish farms in Ohio. Uh, because one of the best ways to learn about fish farming is to learn from other fish farmers, see what they're doing, yeah. what's working for them, how we, we might work together so that we can both improve our businesses. So it's a quite uh, 
it's a, it's a complex program and there's a, there's a lot of aspects to it mm -hmm. uh, beyond just the hands-on training. In the afternoons at these 12 sessions though, we would bring in our business team people and they would focus on business planning, marketing, uh, some of the business aspects of running a business. So by the time you left the program in one year, you had one years of experience, mm -hmm. plus you had a completed business plan. And that's what wow. made the program really unique. That's awesome. How long would one of these 12 sessions take? Would it be like a 12 hour day? It wasn't really, it wasn't a 12 hour day for us because we didn't have to drive, but we had people driving from Cleveland. Yeah. Oh, and so it was like a that four, morning. that morning, yeah, some that morning. came the night before, but some came that morning mm -hmm. and drove home uh, that night, but it was an eight hour day. Okay. And typically uh, about five or six hours was devoted to the hands-on activities and about two hours to the business planning. Now, is there anything in between those 12 sessions that you need there, to do? There's also an online component uh, okay. to the program. Uh, you would have to complete some homework assignments and then uh, because it was a grant funded program we did we were really heavy on the evaluation portion. We so wanted to know what tests. worked and what didn't. You had to mm -hmm. take tests and fill out evaluations but you got it for free. So. Okay. <laughs> Am I graded? <laughs> you Can were I not, fail? No, well actually you weren't <laughs> graded but in order to graduate boot camp you were required to attend 70 percent of all the activities. Okay, well, that's and reasonable. so we graduated mm -hmm. uh, 20 the first year we did it and 19. So we did have some people who uh, dropped out of the program. We started with 25 in uh, both years and ended up with 20 and 19 who actually completed 70 percent of the requirements. Why would oh. somebody drop out? Is it just uh, there were some not personal, what they thought it was? There were personal or, reasons, yeah. there were um, some travel reasons, yeah. or it well, or they even, got into it and it wasn't what they yeah, thought Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I could see that being, well, well this is that's not really what I want to do. Yeah. It is. That's, yeah, that's, once that's you to see, see all that stuff, yeah. It is worth something and uh, because of, we were trying to weed some of that out by picking people who already had uh, had some aquaculture experience, either had a small pilot operation or had been to some conferences and were pretty confident this was the direction they wanted to go. Because mm -hmm. to invest all that time and mm -hmm. uh, energy in training somebody you want. And I thought we had a great success uh, ratio. Of the basically 39 people who graduated in our two years of boot camp, uh, we have 21 that have actually started aquaculture businesses. So nearly 50% are actually in business today with aquaculture business. That's a pretty good That's success pretty rate good. Mm -hmm. versus the alternative, somebody going it alone mm -hmm. for five years. And failing or, and failing or struggling yeah. and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Exactly. Do we have pictures of that or, or any have, of that stuff? I brought some pictures of the, the different activities that we do in boot camp. Um, mm -hmm. It was actually one of my favorite teaching experiences because getting to work with people and actually getting in the ponds and doing the hands-on activities, mm -hmm. teaching them how to properly handle fish, and just uh, uh, removing a lot of their anxiety about what they're going to face. Um, when, that was fun. When you, I think we see a, a couple of shots here. Yeah, now. That we're teaching them how to grade fish. That's a floating fish grader, and so you can put fish in there and grade them uh, depending on size. You can see some people brought their kids some weekend if the babysitting situation sure. <laughs> called okay. for it. But it looks uh, like the guy in the red was probably a bad person because he has to keep his hands. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it was a little chilly that day. That's uh, yeah. Zach, and Zach's actually a soccer coach, so we we even let him be around children. So uh, yeah. uh, he actually has a business uh, called Aquatic Life, and since Cincinnati right now. Huh. So he's one of our he's one of our success stories. The guy who's taking the picture in the camera and the hat, his family owns an apple orchard, a very successful one that does a lot of agritourism and they're wanting to add aquaculture, uh, some of the shrimp farming as another aspect of their agritourism to bring in more uh, uh, more customers early on into their operations. So. How does agritourism work? Agritourism is when you use agriculture uh, as a tourism attraction. Is that when so, I go out in the field and pick pumpkins or what? Pick pumpkins, pick, pumpkins, pick go apples, go for a hayride, yeah. anything mm -hmm. getting people out on the farm. And we can use aquaculture for that too because you saw the pictures mm -hmm. of the freshwater shrimp, shrimp. right there. Mm -hmm. Going to a shrimp harvest is so much fun uh, to get to see how they bring them out of the pond, how they process them, and then getting to take something home to eat mm -hmm. is, is always a a good time. That was one thing I was going to ask. If you get into aquaculture, fish farming, what is the end result? Do you deliver a live fish to someone or do you live, deliver a processed, you know, 
There's a lot of Filet. different products. Uh, the ma actually, the majority of fish farms in Ohio, uh, their product is live fish for pond stocking. We do a lot of recreational pond stocking. People that have ponds in their backyards that want to add bluegill, largemouth bass, uh, yellow perch. Those mm. are all fish that are grown on Ohio fish farms and sold to pond stockers. We okay. also grow a lot of food fish for the Asian market. If you've ever gone into many Asian grocery stores, they usually have live tank displays and they have tilapia, largemouth bass, and, and uh, bluegill and carp mm -hmm. that other cultures prefer to buy live. A lot of our farmers grow uh, for that market. Uh, all, all our freshwater prawn growers just about have festivals or on-farm activities where they bring the clients on and they sell the product uh, whole on ice. It goes home with the customer hmm. uh, that day. Um, some of our products are taken to New York, some are taken to Toronto, Chicago, so it's not just a, a market in Ohio, it also goes uh, throughout the country. So there's hmm. a lot of different markets. At this point, the industry is so small, we do very little processing for food because we just can't compete with those cheap foreign imports. Right. Um, but there's, there is a store in Columbus called Bueller's that is now selling some of our, uh, we have some Ohio raised trout and coho salmon. There's actually coho salmon oh. being raised in Ohio now and being sold at Bueller's and Giant Eagle in Columbus. So I would say within the next 10 years, you're going to see more Ohio raised product in the stores. More, more of that locally grown stuff. Locally uh, grown is huge. Aquaculture, agriculture, mm -hmm. everything now. Everything, yeah. yeah. People are wanting to know where their food comes from and how it's raised. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably maybe a safer thing than catching your bass out of the river. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there are some, there's a lot of uh, restrictions on different waterways in Ohio as far as uh, contaminants and different rivers. And uh, most of the waterways in Ohio, you're restricted to uh, two meals a month, I believe it is. I'm not positive. Hmm on that and so when you have fish that are grown on a farm you don't have those issues wow. you don't have is, those is there things that people worry about with other things uh like hormones and growth things is there yeah, anything aquaculture added to aquaculture has faced a, a lot of criticism sometimes in the media uh, <laughs> but it's mostly due to how it's raised in other countries not how it's raised in the united states mm -hmm. um, there are people who are concerned about uh, antibiotics there's no hormones used to raise fish in the United States, although some fish are spawned using hormones. Mm -hmm. um, so people are concerned mm -hmm. about those things. And the best way for your average consumer who doesn't know a lot about fish to make good decisions when it comes to purchasing their seafood is I always recommend they go to the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program. You can go on their website and actually print off a little folding card that fits into your wallet. And mm -hmm. they have all the popular seafood items that you would find in a grocery store listed either under a green light, a yellow light, or a red light. Anything in the Ooh. green light means you eat as often as you want, and we recommend at least two seafood meals a week. Mm -hmm. Anything in the yellow light is something that you should proceed with caution, only have it every once in a while. And the red light are things that they don't consider environmentally or sustainably uh, raised and they would like you to avoid. This is all done by a very scientific review process, so uh, it's, it's very trustworthy. Almost, almost everything grown in the United States gets a green light. The only one that's in the yellow light is some net pin raised uh, Atlantic salmon hmm. that's raised in the ocean because they have they still have some questions about the environmental sustainability of that. But everything else raised in the United States, anything we raise in Ohio is in the green light. So people can hmm. feel more confident if they're unsure about how to choose good seafood in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. What are the kind of pictures that we have, Luke? Well, that's one of our yellow perch uh, right there. Yellow perch is a very popular fish in Ohio. It's native to the Great Lakes area, and uh, there's still quite a big wild catch coming off of Lake Erie. But uh, our farmers are raising yellow perch again for a lot of stocking of private fish ponds. People love to catch this fish. It's a nice white uh, flaky meat. They cut it into what they call a butterfly fillet where they leave that belly flap mm -hmm. intact. And it is the favorite fish for the Friday night fish fries up along Lake Erie, if you ever get to go to any of those uh, European uh, clubs up there and have a fried fish uh, no, sandwich. I, my wife doesn't like fishy fish. Is this a fishy fish? This is fish? not a fishy fish. Uh, it's one of the, the milder fishes, and I think that's mm -hmm. why people like it so much. Right. It doesn't sort of like have tilapia, a heavy taste. I think is... Like tilapia, it's very, very similar, but, but this is a favorite of everybody's. Mm -hmm. 
that's an example of our boot camp right there. That was our uh, module that we had on fish and feeding, fish nutrition. We showed the students how different diets are made, what to look for, how to select a good diet, how to select the right pellet size and the right ingredients for your particular fish. So we were looking at uh, the diet's ability to stay together in water and not come apart. Um, a lot of different aspects to fish and fish nutrition, but this was kind of a hands-on portion. Uh, we actually made them each eat some fish food so they could, uh, no, just kidding. Wow. <laughs> it's not fear factor, it's boot camp. <laughs> so what, what do fish eat? Is it insects or is it like wheat germ? Or well, in, in, in the wild, of course, they eat insects, but uh, in an aquaculture situation, they're 100% reliant on you for a complete diet. Mm -hmm. And so the diets are made of the same nutrients that your food is. You usually have a protein source, uh, which in the case of a fish diet is either uh, fish meal, soybean meal. Some people are using insect meal as a growing uh, ingredient. Usually has a fat source, which is usually uh, fish oil. And then there's a carbohydrate source, which is usually different types of grains, soybean meal, corn meal, uh, wheat flour, so the oil um, is part of this? It can be part of the pellet too. Oh, you're not dumping oil into no, it? No, 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 no. All these ingredients are mixed together and then a vitamin and mineral premix is added to it and then it's put through a pelleting machine. Okay. And for these, it's a special kind of pelleting machine in that it has to be extruded. It has to be heated with steam or heat so the pellet will float. You don't want it to sink when you feed your pond. If all your feed it sinks to, to the, the bottom, bottom, you can't see it, the fish can't see it. So we create a pellet that actually floats so we can watch our fish feed. Mm -hmm. And as a fish farmer, that's one of the, the mechanisms you use to assess the health of your fish and whether they're growing. It's about the only time you see your crop. Hmm. Well, yeah. with that, how, how do you buy this stuff? I mean, you, obviously the you don't do... Food? Yeah. I, I mean... Do you go to a local store and buy it, or <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, it, it just doesn't. You know, it's not by the dog food or cat food aisle. There's not a fish food aisle. Sometimes you know you can there, see, there is, uh, but it's in little flakes that are in this little yeah. bottle that you feed the aquariums. <laughs> or sometimes and I gotta think in that's, your bigger you, you, farm stores, yeah. you'll see some pond chow, but that's mm -hmm. really not what we're feeding either. There's yeah. about five or six big uh, fish feed manufacturers around the country, mm -hmm. and there's not one in Ohio right now. So all the food that we're feeding our fish is brought in uh, from. From Pennsylvania, there's a new mill in Indiana. Uh, Perina is a big producer of uh, fish foods, uh, spreading out in Idaho, which deals with the trout industry, but we also bring them in. Cargill is another big producer of fish feeds. So there's some big mills mm -hmm. around, and then that food will be imported into Ohio through dis different distribution Fisher methods. Places. Yeah, different mills, different stores, mm -hmm. and then our fish farmers can pick it up from there. Hmm. So, so you generally go to like an ag, an ag store. Yeah, a lot of our farmers deal with the local Perina store and just order their feed and it comes mm -hmm. in on the Perina truck just like that. Just like that. Yeah, huh. just like the other uh, chows that they have, they have the fish yeah. chow. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any more pictures? Uh, that's our group. That was part of the bus tour. I told you aquaponics is very uh, hot right now. This family is the Blackburn family in Richwood, Ohio, and they have about a 35 by 80 foot greenhouse. They raise yellow perch in two 500 gallon tanks, and then they run the uh, wastewater from the perch through the plants. They grow a lot of plants, a lot of leafy greens, and they sell into three different farmers markets in Columbus and about four different restaurants and the chefs are just thrilled with the product that comes out of these systems they love the taste they love the year-round ability this method of farming is very popular in urban areas because mm -hmm. it's so water efficient it uses 90 percent less water than traditional agriculture where you water a plant and you lose the water to the ground this recycles the same water over and over again so it's very efficient. So that was part of our bus tour. You can see the whole boot camp there learning uh, from the other fish farmers. Uh, this is, you talked about some of the markets, the live Asian market. This is one of our large tilapia growers. He's hauling live tilapia right there to stock into the aquariums at the Asian market. So you can see he's doing it all by hand by himself uh, with a hand truck. He will in, there's probably, he probably delivers uh, 500 pounds of fish every week. So it can be a very physically demanding uh, mm. job to offload those fish, take them yeah. inside. And working with a, a different culture takes time too to develop that uh, relationship. There's the tilapia that he delivered in the tank. That's an Asian uh, grocery store up on Bethel Road in Columbus. Uh, those fish um, retail for $3.99 a pound. You buy it live, and then they will process it for you right in front of you, which is mm. what that market 
uh, demand. So those are tilapia in a live tank. Uh, that was our graduation after they made it through 12 months. That's yeah. the, uh, <laughs> the, the graduates. We have a big ceremony, and uh, they all present uh, what they learned in 12 months and, and what they plan to do for the next 12 months. So it was really, you can see how diverse the group is. We had people from urban areas. We had rural areas. Uh, we had a good mix of men and uh, women, and it was just a, a great group to work with. That's a tilapia farm in Frazeesburg, Ohio, uh, near the, our OSU Newark uh, campus. You can see a very large tank of fish there. It's feeding time. You can see how aggressively uh -huh. the fish feed. And again, that was part of our bus tour. And that is an example of aquaponics inside. Like I was telling you, the, the plants are raised on these float beds. They're floating in the water uh, that have the ammonia from the fish in them. And that's a place in Lexington, Kentucky. On site, they have a restaurant and a brewery. They use the mash from the brewery to make part of the fish food to feed the fish, which then grows the plants, and then they sell the plants and the fish in their restaurant. Hmm. It's a real interesting... Uh, that sounds like a whole life cycle. It is the whole life cycle, and it's a great place to visit. They have agritourism in that they charge you $5 a person to tour the place and learn more about the process, so they're, yeah. they're generating an income stream at that point, too. And that's our shrimp harvest. We were telling you that you have to actually drain the pond to get the freshwater prawn out. And that's our class in there, picking the prawn off the bottom of the pond. Uh, newer ponds are actually built with an external catch basin to make this process earlier, but our prawns at the center are, a, are an older model, and so we have to do what we can. But uh, we have a lot of fun that day. We got about 200 pounds of shrimp out of that pond, and then we showed them how to uh, correctly uh, process them, and then we had a couple of chefs come in and cook them up for everybody, hmm. so everybody got to eat so them. So do you have to pick as, them up as well? By you hand? do, and they'll pinch you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know when you say pick them up by hand, so, I know at the end of the pond there's a drain and yeah. uh, they'll just scoop them up with a basket for mm -hmm. it, but there's it's all the little leftover ones the ones the that stragglers get stuck under the algae yeah, mm. that they go pick up yeah and uh, which is you know might end up being a few pounds and there you can see one look how long those claws are that's a couple of our boot campers right there a couple ladies in the class and that's an example of one of the big shrimp that we pulled out of the pond you can see how large it is uh, this was our perch harvest. Again, the class just does whatever we're doing. We made them all get in their waders and harvested yellow perch at the end of the season. You can see it's a little bit cold that day. Everybody's bundled up. Mm -hmm. And again, that's when we were yeah. uh, teaching them how to grade fish. So. so with this, before we get wrapped up, Laura, what is, you said there was, uh, what, 20-some graduates? Yes. What are they doing now? Are, are, are they, are they act actively running a business? Yeah, uh, uh, about 50% are. We have, a, we have a couple that are doing pond stocking businesses. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. We have uh, two or three that have started aquaponics operations uh, mm -hmm. where they've installed greenhouses and they're growing plants mm -hmm. and uh, fish. Uh, one pretty successful one called Waterfields in Cincinnati. Uh, they're not doing the fish right now. They decided to bring that on later after what they learned in our class that they would have to deal with two things. And they're doing microgreens and selling to all the uh, really hoity-toity restaurants in really? Cincinnati. Uh, we have two in the first class that partnered together and opened up a tilapia farm over near Wilmington. Mm -hmm. um, so just a, a lot of exciting. And wow. the, the tilapia farm that you saw there uh, mm -hmm. towards the end, he actually was only two years into that business and decided to join boot camp. So he already had a, a tilapia operation, but learned a lot in the class. Learned so. a lot of new stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so, it, it, so awesome. there, there's really a wide variety. One mm -hmm. guy's raising yellow perch fingerlings. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody's raising trout. Yeah. So it's just a huge variety. It's, it's really been a, a successful and a worthwhile program. So uh, Maybe I'd like to get into it. I'd, <laughs> I'd like to raise sharks with laser beams on their forehead. Oh, oh yeah. Wow. We had one business well, now you, plan you gotta, for that. You've got to write all that big report just to get into this book. Yeah. yeah so. And then I didn't even tell you about the push-ups. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Imagine what kind of exercises you have to do with these fish. Probably I am, the, the, uh, and I am the general, so yeah. I, uh, I, awesome. I get pretty tough on them sometimes. Get in the pond. Absolutely. <laughs> so wow. where, where can we find how to get it in, to, in touch with you and how to get into the program? You can actually go to our OSU South Center's webpage, uh, and we actually documented everything that we did for the two years of boot camp. You can see videos of the mm. hands-on activities. You can see all the homework assignments. You can sign up to uh, come to some of 
our conferences. We still have two conferences coming up this summer, one on aquaponics and one on marketing and processing. And then while we don't have a class this year, an actual class that's meeting this year, uh, we hope to have that uh, back in place by 2016. So go to the OSU South Center's website. Uh, my contact information will be there and feel free to contact us with any questions you might have. Sounds really mm -hmm. interesting. It's a lot of fun. Well, thanks for uh, joining us here on AgriTalk, yeah. Dr. Laura, too. Yes. Uh, Dwayne. Yes, and uh, we'll see you next time on uh, AgriTalk, I guess. Okay, Thank thanks you. for watching. Thank you.